Let's revisit our first example of a bimolecular elementary reaction. The gas phase collision of carbon monoxide with diatomic oxygen to form carbon dioxide and individual oxygen atoms. Let us now ask ourselves a question. Will every such collision lead to a successful reaction? And if not, what exactly is it that would prevent the reaction from being successful? One clear problem would be the orientation of the reactant molecules. Some mutual orientations work, while others do not. But there is another factor, the kinetic energy of the collision. For each reaction, there seems to be a certain amount of kinetic energy you need to have for the reaction to be successful. We can understand this by looking at the potential energy of the system as the reaction progresses. Our y-axis is that potential energy of the system, and our x-axis is the extent of the reaction, also known as the reaction coordinate. The left-hand side represents the separated reactants at whatever their energy is. The right-hand side represents the separated products at whatever their energy is. This specific example is endothermic because it takes a lot of energy to make an isolated oxygen atom. The middle corresponds to the path that the reaction takes from reactants to products. Notice that there is a hill of energy that the system has to somehow get over in order to become products. That energy is known as the activation energy, and is notated with the symbol E sub A. So if we measure the kinetic energy of the molecules relative to each other, and compare it to the activation energy, we can tell whether the system will be able to get over the hump. How do we know how many molecule pairs will have enough energy to get over the hump? Well, remember the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of molecular speeds, which we talked about several lessons back in the context of vapor pressure? In that discussion, we noted that there was a threshold energy for molecules to escape their intermolecular attractions to their neighbors, allowing them to enter the gas phase, and that the fraction of the molecules that exceeds that threshold goes up with increasing temperature. Well, we just introduced the same concept of kinetic energy threshold for a collision-based reaction to happen, so we should expect the same kind of temperature dependence. You may recall that we described the vapor pressure of a liquid using the clausius clapeyron equation. I'm not going to go through the proof, but this equation can be rearranged into this form, which is going to serve as the model we will use to look at reaction rates. The idea in this version is that we have folded the information on a reference vapor pressure, say the boiling point, into the constant C. And so we have E raised to the power of negative energy over RT. How do we apply this idea to the temperature dependence of a reaction rate? Well, we use exactly the same expression for the rate coefficient. We've relabeled the constant A, which we will call the frequency factor. And instead of the enthalpy change of vaporization, we use the activation energy. This equation is known as the Arrhenius equation, and it does a fantastic job of modeling how rate coefficients change with temperature. Conceptually, though, all it is doing is modeling how many molecule pairs at a given temperature have relative kinetic energy in excess of the activation energy, and then modifying it with the frequency factor to account for things like orientation. If there are very few orientations that will work, A is small, but if nearly any orientation will work, A is large. Notice that we can manipulate this equation to make it look a bit more like the original clausius clapeyron equation, which conveniently linearizes the equation for us. And so if we plot the natural log of the rate coefficient versus 1 over temperature, we get a straight line, whose slope lets us determine this activation energy. So the model we have is of reactant collisions needing to have enough kinetic energy to make it over the activation barrier which has a magnitude known as the activation energy. They acquire this kinetic energy by virtue of the temperature, and the number of collisions that are successful is reduced by the frequency factor based on how restrictive the reaction is concerning mutual orientation. A collision that has enough energy and the right orientation makes it over the barrier, passing through a configuration known as the transition state before progressing onto products. Let's look a bit closer at the energies involved. In a bimolecular collision like the one we've been discussing, the reacting pair have a certain amount of energy combined from the potential energy and their kinetic energy. And because of the conservation of energy principle, that total amount of energy is constant. Let's say it's here. In this case, the system moves to the right, meaning that the reactants get closer together. And as the potential energy begins to rise, the kinetic energy has to correspondingly fall. 
by the time the system reaches the point where the total energy equals the potential energy, there's no energy left for the kinetic energy. So the only thing the system can do is fall back apart. Now, if on the other hand, the total energy of the system is higher, then the system still has some kinetic energy when it crosses the transition state. And at that point, the products can start to move away from each other, carrying away the excess kinetic energy. Let's consider another reaction now, which also happens in the upper atmosphere. In this reaction, a hydrogen atom collides with an oxygen molecule to form HO2. This reaction, unlike our previous example, is exothermic. But all of the same concepts about activation energy still apply. But this reaction also has another difference. There is only one product. So let's trace the energy of a successful reaction like we did in the previous case. The system successfully crosses the activation barrier to get to products. But now we don't have separate molecules that can carry away the excess kinetic energy. The single molecule product is stuck with all this extra kinetic energy, and the only place it can be is in the vibrations within the molecule, which as a result will shake the molecule apart and send it right back over the activation barrier to the reactant side, but this time with the separate fragments moving away from each other instead of toward each other. Yet I started this part of the lesson saying that the reaction happens in the upper atmosphere. So what's going on? Well, for this reaction to successfully stay at products, there needs to be some other way for the excess kinetic energy to leave the system. This reaction is not bimolecular. It is termolecular. Here, M refers to any other gas molecule or atom. Now when the system collides in a simultaneous three-body collision, there is something, the M, that can carry away the excess kinetic energy. Three-body collisions are quite rare, so there aren't many termolecular reactions but they can occasionally happen, and this example gives you a reason why they are sometimes necessary. Finally, let's take a look at a unimolecular reaction, N2O4, decomposing into two nitrogen dioxide molecules. In this case, we don't have the collisions between reactants causing the system to have enough energy to make it over the barrier. But it does have something to do with collisions. Remember this picture? Where the molecules in a gas have some distribution of speeds? Well, this can be generalized to kinetic energy. The molecules have some distribution of kinetic energies, and there will always be some in the tail of the graph at high energies. They get that energy by colliding with other molecules and exchanging energy with them. Sometimes a collision will leave most of their energy with one of the two collision partners. So there is a steady state amount of molecules that through collisions have gained whatever threshold energy you need. So while most molecules may not have enough energy to make it over the barrier, a few will have enough, and then the products will carry away the excess as relative motion. Those products can then collide with more reactant molecules, transferring their energy to them and starting the process all over again. So what we have now is a theory of elementary gas phase reactions that encompasses unimolecular, bimolecular, and termolecular processes. In all cases, we can model the process as collision-based, where the resulting reactants have enough energy to pass over an activation barrier. The rate laws for these elementary reactions come from the reaction stoichiometry, and in all cases, the rate constant has a temperature dependence that is described by the Arrhenius equation, explicitly showing the impact of the activation energy on the reaction. So what this means is that elementary reactions of all types speed up as temperature increases, because there will be a larger fraction of the molecules or collisions that have sufficient energy to get over the reaction barrier.